Hello all, and welcome to Brewing with Jim, hosted by Jim Brewington. Jim is a pastor and a teacher, and has served in these roles for the past 45 years. He has worked in small churches and mega churches, primarily as a teacher serving both the hearing and the deaf population. We have surveyed the students here at CVCS and do our best to create a genuine conversation around the talking points the students want to know most about. Thank you all for listening and taking time to brew on Life's Questions with Jim. Hello all and welcome to Brewing with Jim. I'm your producer, Grady Sanchez, and as always, we have Jim. Hello everybody. I'm glad you're here. Thank you all for listening today. We have a great show ahead for you and today we are focusing on friendship so let's start off with an easy one Jim what makes a good friend and what is something that you look for in a friend <laughs> I was talking um, now I'm talking to the listeners talking to Grady before we started sometimes I put some thought into these questions uh, this time uh, I'm not even sure what the questions are, and so there's absolutely not only non-scripted, but uh, I have no idea what we're going to say and where this is going to go. Grady and I are just going to talk. Okay, what was the question? What <laughs> makes a good friend? What makes a good friend, and what are some qualities that you look for in a good friend? Um, well, I think it would be easier to start uh, with what makes a bad friend. And what makes a bad friend would be someone who influences uh, me to go in the wrong direction and to now the wrong direction needs to be defined but there are people who will uh, influence either intentionally or just passively by being in a friendship with you and kind of guide you uh, to break the law to uh, use substances you're not supposed to use to uh, disrespect authority to all the all the offensive um, behaviors and attitudes that are generally accepted as offensive, that you don't want that friend. That friend needs, um, needs to be a friend with somebody else. Uh, I would suggest that we don't try to be friends with somebody so that we can fix them. That, if that's what you want to do, become a therapist and uh, work with them that way. But our friends are not projects. Our friends are uh, just companions, and uh, oftentimes more companions than, closer companions than others. What was the other part of that question? Oh, what makes a good friend? And what, are, what traits do I look for? I think everybody's going to look for different traits depending on their personality. For me, one of the number one traits is sense of humor. I don't want to spend a lot of time with somebody who's humorless. Uh, and it can either be an expressive uh, spend, uh, sense of humor, uh, they are funny, or they ha and they see humor in almost everything in life, uh, or it can be receptive humor that they just laugh and have a good time and uh, they see humor that way. So sense of humor for me is right up there close to the top. Um, I would want somebody, I do want my friends to be confidants that when I tell them something and it's in confidence, uh, they keep that. The person who is the best at keeping confidences, the best I have ever known, is me. I am really good at that. I honor that. Uh, when somebody tells me something, it goes nowhere. Uh, I don't tell my wife. It doesn't become a teaching illustration. Uh, I don't tell that one special friend that I tell everything to. I don't tell anybody. And I won't even acknowledge that I had a conversation with somebody. Uh, if they want to know about somebody else, go to that person and find out that person. So what do we have? We have sense of humor, keep confidences. I'll tell you one thing that isn't important to me anymore. I don't need to have somebody my age. Now, a lot of people in high school, they want friends who are their age. I suggest that you befriend somebody who is older and, and maybe even much older and you will benefit from that friendship and they will benefit from your friendship. So all the um, commonly thought of traits, I want somebody who likes to do the same things I like to do. I like somebody who's my age. I like somebody who has the same uh, 
a political party, the same um, denomination in the church, even the same religion. Would I be friends with a non-Christian? Absolutely. I would be friends with a non-Christian. So uh, I would throw all those things out and expand the repertoire, expand the reservoir, both, uh, of the pool that you can draw your friends from. I don't, what do you think? Do you have what qualities, characteristics would you look for? For me, sense of humor and honesty go a long way. Yes. And something that I learned growing up when we were talking about what makes a bad friend um, is the best words of advice I ever got was, you are the five people you hang out with. You are, a co- <laughs> you are a collection of those people. So when you're looking at who you are as a person, look at your friends. Yeah. And then that's going to be almost the mirror or the reflection of who you are. If your friends are making bad decisions, you might be you're right there in the with wrong them. place. Yes. Uh-huh. If your friends are making good decisions, you might be in the right place. My friends from high school, they went very far, and I'm very proud of them. They, one in, uh, the doctor, another one's in the Air Force, another one's... Um, in sales, or I think two of them are in sales, and I guess I'm a teacher, and those would be my five best friends from high school. And seeing how far they've made it, I was just like, oh, okay, I must have been okay. So like, it's we're in a good group of birds friends. of a feather flock together. Yeah, is that a cliche? I guess it is, or yeah. a proverb, or something. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's pretty true. I'm look, I'm thinking now back to friends I had when I was in high school. And the ones that I remember uh, were encouragers. And they encouraged me. They accepted me for who I am. They didn't try to change me. Uh, They introduced me to other people as my close friend. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, uh, I do not like the term best friend. I don't refer to anybody as my best friend because if you do that, What are all the other friends going to think? Well, what am I then? I'm somebody who's not the best. So it's just, that's a small point, but it's a a language point, and I don't call anybody my best friend. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that when I am choosing friends, well, I don't know that I actually choose friends. I have walked up to people that I thought I would like to know better, And just say to them, I don't know you very well, and I'd like to know you better. Would you be willing to have a cup of coffee with me and talk about yourself so I can know you better? That's never been turned down, ever. And some of those people have become good friends, and some, when they begin to talk about themselves, I think uh, maybe I'll look elsewhere for somebody. (laughs) But we can make the evaluation uh, uh, based upon personal preferences, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. And then my daughter, she's four. Cutest thing at the park is she'll have people come up to her or she'll go up to other kids and they'll just be like, do you want to be my friend? <laughs> and it's this joyful spirit that she has or the other kids have. Does about that just work? Like, yeah. And they start playing in the sand and Hopefully nobody throws sand at each other. So, <laughs> And then we see him at the park again because we live next to it and we see the same family. And we've gotten to know different people just by our daughter going up to people and she hey, do you want to be a friend? And I don't know if she knows the true meaning of that, but she knows that if they play together, they are friends. Well, we're sort of laying out what the true meaning of that is right now. Uh, just trying to put some pieces together about mm-hmm. friendship. Um, I know that... Um, because we are both teachers, there is an axiom in the education profession that I thoroughly disagree with, and that is, you remember, you're their teacher, not their friend. Uh Uh-uh. I'm their friend first. I would really be honored to be their friend and their teacher at the same time. The greatest teacher who ever lived calls me friend, and I uh, do not shy away from that relationship Uh, with my students. Now, the nature of the friendship is not the same as the nature of the friendship I have with colleagues or with um, people I have known since I was in the Navy, and I'm still in touch with some of those people. People I have known since I was in high school, I'm still in touch with some of those people. 
Uh, speaking of staying in touch with your old Navy buddies and your old high school buddies, <laughs> we have seniors who are going off to college. We have people who are listening who are moving on to the next phase of life. How? Yeah. What ways can you stay in touch and keep a close friendship with people who aren't necessarily in proximity to you? Oh, my goodness. Now it's easy, isn't it, with all the technology? We, all, we can text. We can... We used to not be able to call very frequently because it was a long-distance call, and we had to pay by the minute. When we talked on the phone, we don't have any of that. Um, I would not try to stay in touch with people by social media. That's just my preference. Uh, I like one-on-one conversations. But um, I still talk to people on the phone, and they call me. Uh, I think it's easier to stay in touch now, but the initiative to do it is mine. I have to do, I don't wait for somebody to contact me. I will contact them. If you wait, you're thinking, well, I don't know, do they like me anymore? Is this going to be a problem? I initiate it and I stay on it. I learned that from a pastor mentor I had one time who uh, just stayed on top of everybody, in touch with everybody. Uh, in the church, I think. It was a small church, but uh, 350 families, something like that. But you just initiate it. You have to initiate it. I had a friend in high school. She made the interesting social experiment of, she was super outgoing. She was the one who initiated everything. And then she took (laughs) two weeks off of initiating, and she realized that nobody texted her. And so her being the initiator, she was the one who got things going. And then she almost felt lonely because nobody took the moment to text her to get things going with her. She was always the one who did it. And so in that social experiment with her friends, she's like, do I have true friends if they're not willing to text me without me texting them? Right. And so it was just whole, this whole kind of conundrum of do I really want to initiate? Do I really want to be these fr- with these people? Or is it? something in her own personality that she is that person who is a good friend and going forward. Well, I think the best way to find, or one of the ways to find a friend is to be one and just be one to somebody else and be the kind of friend you would want to be. Uh, There are, the word friend becomes cliche. It's tossed around uh, about people who are in our lives that they're not really friends. Um, Colleagues here at the school, they're work friends, but we never socialize outside of school. I get very few calls from people that I call friends here at the school uh, to go out and uh, have lunch and and so forth. Some, but not very many. So the friendship uh, definition needs to change. I think that, uh, or at least not change so much as to be um, more specific so that we can Uh, not categorize the people who are in our lives, but certainly if there's a friend and that friendship is mutual, uh, they like me and I like them, uh, we both know it. We both know it. And I think it's certainly proper to say, you know what, I'm really glad you're in my life. Once in a while, I'll say this. I'm really glad you're in my life and thank you for the friendship. Mm. And then I'm going to use some high school slang here. (laughs) Kind of... How, how do you deal with the toxic friends? How do you deal toxic, with that? Poisonous. Yes. How, how, do, you, how do you deal with that uh, <laughs> negative uh, peer pressure, that negative friend pressure that we were talking about earlier? In high school, it's drama this, drama that. You go from one friend group to another. We're at a small school, so finding friend groups is a little bit more difficult. But when we have those toxic friends, how do you either mend that relationship or end that relationship? The first thing that comes to my mind is, do you really want a friend group? Uh, Some people enjoy being uh, gregarious, and they like to have lots of friends. We're going to Disneyland. Fifteen of us are going to Disneyland. I'm not that person. I like one-on-one relationships. I like um, couple-on-couple dinners. I don't like parties. I really don't like parties. I know that that's going to cause some thinking with some people. The reason I don't like parties is because uh, nobody ever shows up, just their body does. Uh, It seems like the minds don't show up. And uh, one evening, three hours of weather talk doesn't quite cut it for me. But uh, I think that we we can have closer relationships 
by being a closer friend ourselves. And then if it's reciprocated, it's reciprocated. Now, you were talking about toxic friendships. Uh, get away from them. Get away from them. That's a biblical principle. They'd flee from evil. Flee. And I'm not saying the friends are evil necessarily, but if they're lead leading me down the wrong path, they're influencing me to be something less than uh, the integrity in my life that I want to have, if, then I need to go somewhere else. Now, what if I have an established friendship and that person um, offends me or is talking about me uh, uh, outside of the friendship with other people in a negative way? And what do you do? Well, what you do is go to that person and you go privately to that person and say, you know what, this is what I'm hearing. Is this true? And you did say this to me and you did treat me this way. Were you not feeling well or did you mean it? Do I need to know more about what's going on? So you sit down with the idea to resolve this issue. This um, is Matthew 18. I was going to say, it, don't, it, don't make an offering until you have... Well, that's... Um, until you've reconciled. Reconciled with your, your buddy. Leave yes. your offering there. Go back home, reconcile with your buddy, and then come back. Matthew, the Matthew 18 principle I, has been used so often, I use it as a verb. Did you Matthew 18 him? Did you Matthew 18 her? Um, and it says that if you have a problem, actually it says if your uh, brother has sinned against you. But I'm going to soften that and say if you have a problem with your brother, you go to your brother. Go right to, you don't go to your brother's mother. You don't go to the homeowners association. You don't go to anybody except that person. And you sit down privately and you try to work that out. If it doesn't work out, then you go get two or three other people who are disinterested in the relationship. And they come and they help evaluate and reconcile and uh, resolve the problems that are there. And then Matthew 18 says, uh, if you if that doesn't work, you go to a pastor. You go to the church. That doesn't mean it's announced from the pulpit. It means you go to the leader of the church. You go to a pastor. And if that doesn't work out, then Matthew 18 says you're to treat that person as a heathen. And, uh, well, how do you treat a heathen? Jesus took him to dinner. So go to dinner with this person and sit down and see what kind of magic can happen with a meal. And that will help not only reconcile, reconciliation is another issue. Maybe it's on your list, I don't know. But uh, that will certainly take care of a toxic relationship. And then if none of that works out, flee, get somebody else, because you don't want somebody to drag you down the wrong path. Excellent. Excellent. Wise words. Let's talk about reconciliation a minute. Yeah. If, what do I do if my friend is no longer my friend and they have separated from me or I have separated from them or we have separated from each other? How do we get back together? We do it through reconciliation. And reconciliation is the, the greatest example of that is what Christ did on the cross. Uh, it's one of the seven salvific uh successes of the cross, uh, he provided for us reconciliation. He reached out to us. When I do weddings, I look at the groom and I say, I want to talk to you. I mean, this is a charge now. Uh, well, it's not how much I'm, I want you to pay me. This is the pastoral charge. Um, when you and your wife are having some sort of a spat and you're sitting on opposite ends of the couch with God's frozen tundra in between you, who's going to reconcile? And I'm telling you, sir, you are the first to reach out in reconciliation. Then I look at the bride and I say the same thing. You are the first to reach out in reconciliation. Now they're both charged to do that. Um, picture in your mind the word written reconciliation, written. Shun at the end means that which does or is. Re means again. Con means with. And ciliate means to set up or to establish. 
that which sets up or establishes to be with again. That's what reconciliation is. Now, I'm not in charge of the reconciliation when I initiate it. It takes two. Some would say it takes three. Uh, But it takes two to reconcile. I am in charge of leaving the door wide open for the reconciliation to happen. If the other person decides they don't want to reconcile, I can't do anything about that. But I am going to reach out and say, you know what, Um, I want to be your friend again, and I'll do whatever I can to leave the door open, and whenever you're ready, if you are, uh, come to me and we'll be friends again. The things are connecting with me, and I'm, I'm enjoying every, every part of this. Me too. This conversation today. And to bring home our, our last question on a lighter note, I recently got a dog, and this is either going to make or break the podcast. What um, kind? I got a I got a Bichon Frise. It was my father-in-law's who oh. had passed away, and um, we had got him. I had a really good relationship with him, and so we those got are the, the little and, white fluffy things, right? Yep, yeah, a couple cotton balls with legs, mm-hmm. and he's, yeah, pink he's, on both ends. He's a little older now, <laughs> and <laughs> yes. um, has a big personality. So where, where do you stand? Are you a dog person or a cat person? Well, I don't know this kind of person. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have had um, a dog in my life since I was four years old, with the exception of the time I was in the Navy. Uh, not many dogs on ships, but I've had a dog. I like dogs. I like, um, a, except for some breeds I don't care for because they're viciously aggressive and in, in a surprising way. And uh, I don't want that around my house, uh, certainly my kids. But I like dogs. Dogs are, uh, I think God put dogs on earth to teach us how to forgive. Uh, they can be abused and forgive in moments. They, they may be afraid. They may be timid of, of type of person who abused them, but they get over that. And uh, that's a lesson I need to have in my face uh, most of the time. Uh, Statistics, again, that I can't verify, but have been told, uh, people who have dogs live longer than people who don't have dogs. And I'm not sure about parakeets and uh, the other animals, the geckos, and what else do people have? But uh, I think it's a measure of enjoyment and pleasure to have a dog. And they all have different personalities. And they all have their own personalities. And sometimes it's like being around a kid. They're expensive. If they're well, were, excuse me, well cared for, they are um, time-consuming. And to me, they're worth it. Uh, so do you have any dogs? Never had one, no. 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 (laughs) Yeah, we do. Um, Debbie, my wife, uh, received a Yorkie for her birthday um, 16, 17 months ago. No, this dog's only 15 months old. Must have been 11 or something. Anyway, this is a young dog. And um, I thought, a Yorkie? Yeah, my wife had one when when we first got together. You know... why would I want this instead of a real dog? And so now I'm smitten by this dog. This is so cool to have this dog. And we're thinking about uh, getting a friend for this dog. I'm leaning toward a schnauzer, a mini- miniature schnauzer. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So dogs. We had a cat. And... Um, Deb had a friend who was elderly and uh, was dying and really almost on her deathbed. And Debbie was there standing at bedside. And the friend looked up at her and said, will you take care of my cat? And Debbie said, yes. I would have looked into her eyes with love and compassion deeply into her eyes and said no. (laughs) But we took care of this cat and this thing came home and lived with us for months and months and months until it died uh, a natural death and we took care of it. 
but it was so shy that it never came around. It spent its whole life in one room upstairs. Um, I just am having trouble relating to the value of having a cat when I compare it to a dog. Me too. I'm more of a, a dog person too, and uh, I've really enjoyed having, his name's Harley. We got a new dog named Harley. And so <laughs> our old dog, our Yorkie was named Munchie, and we really loved Munchie. And so it was hard for us to take in an, another dog, but having the relationship with him earlier, it was like, oh yeah, we'll take him. He's awesome. He's, How do you have a little white fluffy thing called Harley? <laughs> That's right. No, it, just, it doesn't seem to fit. No, but he's got that personality and that he does have a, a good growl that re- resembles a, a Harley itself. So we, we have enjoyed <laughs> having him and uh, we look forward to, to building our girls. And our gr- Mila was asking, my oldest daughter, she was asking for a dog weeks in advance before we even knew we were talking about Harley or getting him. And so she wakes up the, the morning we were going to go to get him without her knowledge. She's like, can I have a dog? Can we go get a dog today? I'm like, we're getting a dog today. So. I think dogs are good for kids. I think so, too. Teach them responsibility. Teach them forgiveness. Teach them relationships. Mm-hmm. Teach them you know, they're, they're not humans. Uh, there are some people who treat their dogs as children. I don't do that. The, the dog is the dog, and the child is the child, and they're not the same. But they are to be protected. We are to take care of the animals. We are to, um, to name the animals. That was Adam's charge. So uh, I'm pro-dog, definitely. Awesome. Well, that's a wrap here on Brewing with Jim. (laughs) Thank you all for listening today, and we hope to talk to you and interact with you. Please send us your questions at brewingwithjim at gmail.com. And thank you all for, again, listening and taking the time to brew on life's questions with Jim. Ditto. Me too. Thank you. Topics covered and answers offered in Brewing with Jim mine the wisdom attained from a life of pastoral ministry and care. They do not constitute professional or clinical training or expertise in the areas of counseling or mental health. CVCS and its podcast network want to provide a platform for the discipleship of our community. Brewing with Jim is our attempt to foster that environment in a format that is accessible and open for all to partake in. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and may or may not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Capistrano Valley Christian Schools or its faculty. The material and information presented here are for general information purposes only. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Capistrano Valley Christian Schools is a Christian JK-12 school in San Juan Capistrano, California. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.